Wow, it's been, uh, it's been a while, hasn't it? And uh, I am so excited to be here this morning. And uh, first of all, I just want to say, um, I can't believe I just got to do what I just got to do. Um, what a tremendous gift to me. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can turn that into a tremendous gift for all of us, as uh, uh, perhaps God will use uh, what I experienced and uh, um, will... We'll share that uh, little bit by little bit over the next few weeks. I'm not going to dump it all at once. <clears throat> it would take a little bit too long. But uh, um, <clears throat> in preparation for what I'm about to say, could you turn to uh, in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings is about in the middle of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, and uh, you, if you can start turning there, I'll start telling you uh, what we did the first week. That I was gone, uh, we left here, went to St. Louis, stayed the night with Caleb and Bridget, our, our, uh, our third son and his wife, uh, who are going to have a baby in February, woo, we're excited about that, another boy in the family, uh, to the one who when Noah was born stomped on the floor and said, what do we got to do to get a girl in this family, and uh, he's, he's still wondering that, and so um, anyway, went uh, with... Uh, with them, and then drove to Alabama uh, with some good friends we hadn't seen for like 20 years. Uh, Dave and Beth King got to worship with them in their church. Not a very big church, but it was a church uh, that was brimming with life, and God was doing good new things and uh, wonderful things. Then we drove on to Florida, where at Panama City Beach, I spent two weeks, and uh, Sherry was there uh, about a week and a half with me. She flew back. Um, I, I spent a lot of the days, as you can tell, I'm not really a sun person, uh, and, uh, but enjoyed the beach, enjoyed the ocean, uh, enjoyed um, just, just God's beauty there, um, but spent a lot of the days writing and, and uh, uh, doing the project that I felt like God was leading me into, and then um, went from Florida to Oklahoma, from God's country to Whatever Oklahoma is. And um, there I got to play golf with my dad, uh, which is a lot of fun. He loves golf. I don't love golf, but I love my dad. And so it was a, it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. Uh, played with my uncle and, and a couple of other people as well. And then uh, my mom loves Route 66. They live along Route 66. So we visited several tourist traps with her uh, on Route 66, and that I don't love that either, but I love my mom, and I love golf, and I love my dad, so I also have an affinity for Route 66 and the tourist traps. And then um, uh, we went to some, uh, I went uh, from there to the Ada, Oklahoma, where some friends live, and they have a ranch, and worked on their ranch with them. They were preparing for their pumpkin patch, which uh, which has started last year at their pumpkin patch. They had 16,000 people come through this year. They're expecting more. Uh, last year, for classes from schools, they had 150. This year, before they ever even started, they had signed up 300 classes. So, so it's just going to be just this great time, and that funds all their children's camps and things like that. And I got to spend time with goats, and uh, that, that was always fun. Got to do some... Some great writing there, got to help them and, and uh, that kind of thing. And then went from there to Colorado where this was outside of my front door. That's Pikes Peak. And uh, one morning, uh, one Sunday morning when I was there, uh, when I got up, um, Pikes Peak was clear and all of that. A storm came through and then Pikes Peak had snow on it. So uh, while I was up there, it didn't snow in Divide where I was, but that was 9,000 feet. Uh, when I drove through Pueblo, Colorado, at about 4,000 feet, it was 90 degrees. When I got to Colorado Springs, at about 5,400 uh, 5, uh, feet, it was uh, uh, right around 70 degrees. When I got into Divide, Colorado, it was uh, uh, right around uh, 59 degrees. So it was it was beautiful. <laughs> it was it was the kind of weather that I love, and things like that. And God really blessed me. We came back. I, um, Sherry flew out to be with me out there, and uh, then we drove back together, drove 4,000 miles. Um, my little speedometer thing said I spent 80 hours driving and 280 some odd gallons of gas. 
Lord help us, man. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, anyway, so I'm done driving for a while. Uh, I, I enjoy that kind of thing, but I'm done driving for a little while. And, and God was so, so good to me. One of the things I did was slept, I slept in for the first time in my life, like every day. And uh, so this morning it was hard to get up. I just want you to know. Hey, how many of you uh, were here last night for our outdoor worship? Yeah, how about that? Was that great or what? Uh, God was there in a special way. Um, I think we had about 115 people there. It was a lot of new faces and things like that. Thank you. While I was gone, you got to experience some former pastors uh, and uh, some friends of mine and, and things like that. And God moved in a good way. Before I left, I asked you if you would uh, bring someone, <laughs> if you would bring it which, which meant your enthusiasm, bring your, your passion for God. And it sounds like uh, you did that. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to kick it up a notch even uh, beyond that. Is that all right? Is that all right? Hey, how many of you watched uh, the Chiefs win on Monday night? Anybody here watch that? Uh, I, I, I want to ask you, not, not gloating by any means, but, but uh, um, did you notice that after the Chris Jones penalty that the energy of Arrowhead was amped up a little bit. Did you notice that? If you didn't notice that, we might need to check your eyeballs and things like that. I mean, there was just vitriol. Did you see the guy in the, he had the visor on and it was backwards and he was yelling and foam was coming out of his mouth. Did you see that? And the whole place was like that. Probably at your house, it was like that a little bit too. Anybody need to buy a new TV because they threw something at it? Um, that I was tempted to throw some things at it. So the energy kicked up a notch in Arrowhead, didn't it? But the energy there was driven by hatred for a ref. And uh, they were saying some not so nice things about the ref and they just couldn't hide it on TV. I expected them, you know, to, to, to cover it in some way, but they didn't. Anyway, um, but I think God wants to ratchet up our intensity, not out of hatred, not because we're afraid of an enemy. Uh, not because uh, because we have an enemy that we're fighting, uh, though that is true, but uh, ratchet up our intensity of love for God and uh, of of following after His Spirit. So so hold on to your your socks. We're gonna ratchet up the intensity here just a little bit. As I was on this trip, um, I talked with several folks, and even before that, here talking with some folks, um, I've heard the word revival many times that people are longing for revival. Now, there are two camps with that. As, as people were talking to me, I sensed there were some that really wanted God to move in a fresh and real way throughout his church, not just our church, but the church in, in a broader sense. There was another uh, part to that where I felt like God, people were saying, we want God to do what he used to do the way that he used to do it. And so I want to talk to you about revival this morning. We're going to do that as we look at 1 Kings chapter 17, okay? Uh, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? This is no ordinary book. We're called to participate this morning. Don't let me preach this by myself today. Feel free to clap, cheer, hang from the rafters, throw things, uh, and shout, you know, discouraging words. I don't know. Uh, but, let, let, but be involved this morning. So 1 Kings chapter 17, we'll start with verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up. Everybody say, the brook dried up. up. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, meaning Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath in the re region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord our God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. 
Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Can't we just celebrate this, that this morning? That's God's provision, yes. Then there's one more verse that I'd like to read over you this morning. That's a different verse, a strange verse, the next one. Sometime later... The son of the woman who, uh, who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. Turn to somebody and say, that's a weird turn. That's a weird turn. Please be seated. Please be seated. It's a strange turn. Have you ever had that happen in your life? You're cruising along just fine and God is doing some neat things and then something happens. You're not sure what to think about that. Not sure what to do with that. We want to talk about revival. Revival. When something is restored. When something is strengthened again. When something becomes important again. Revival. Now we're resurrection people. We're resurrection people. We... Uh, we acknowledge and celebrate what Jesus did on the cross and that the power of it is evident in the empty tomb. We believe our God brings life to things that are dead. Do you believe that this morning? Resurrection. Resurrection. Resurrection and revival do not differ in essence. They differ in degree. In order to look at revival, I think we need to look at the first resurrection this morning. See, Scripture says that if we aren't in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, we're dead in our sins. We've been separated from the thing that gives us life, from the one that gives us life, and our efforts will be futile until we find life in him. Uh, as Augustine once said, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. We need resurrection. We need salvation. Resurrection is for those who don't know God. Sal they don't know God's salvation and they need to come to life in him. Revival is not when the lost get found, when the broken are saved. Revival is when those who are following God have a fresh encounter with him. Now, I want to tell you a couple of things about that. The first thing I want you to know is that you cannot experience revival on your own. It may start in you, but revival overflows to those around you. You can have a moment, but it's not a revival if it's just you. Evidence that the Spirit of God is at work in revival is that it influences more than you. It influences us. There are some here and throughout America that believe they don't need the church. I've read the New Testament, and I just want to say to you and be a smart aleck this morning, how does it feel to know that God disagrees? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't need church to be in a deep relationship with God, and God is going, lies! <laughs> I'm out! <laughs> we need each other. And it's very evident in throughout Scripture and throughout the New Testament especially that we need the church, this thing God created for our very health and well-being as a follower of Jesus that we might grow up in Him and then be used by Him throughout the world. We need each other. To see a revival, we need it to happen among 
us. And to see revival, I think we need to see the first resurrection. Let's see how, how we got where we were. How we got to the place where verse 7 says the brook dried up. I just want you to remember the per, remind the person next to you the brook dried up. Okay, tell them the brook dried up. Brook dried up. All right, so when we go back to um, verse 1 of chapter 17, here's, here's what we find out. Now, Elijah, the Tishmite, that's to differentiate him from any other Elijah you know. You know, <laughs> Elijah from Excelsior Springs, okay? From Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. There's a new king in the land. His name is Ahab, and he has decided Israel's going in the wrong direction. They should not be worshiping the God of the Israelites, Yahweh. They should be worshiping Baal instead. And he marries a woman named Jezebel. Her family is famous for uh, worshiping uh, the Baals. And so he builds a temple to the Baals. He erects a statue of Baal in the temple. He begins killing off, slaughtering the prophets of God, which Elijah is one of them. And uh, Elijah goes up to him and says, you may be king, but God still holds the world in his hands. You may lead our nation... But God is still in control, and God's not going to let it rain until you change your ways. I want that to be a reminder of us the next time you watch the news and go flipping out over something that happens nationally or internationally, that we serve a God who has the world in his hands. He, we serve a God who's in control. And you know what? He's not frightened of the other political party, and he is not frightened of the other leaders in our world. He's got the world in his hands. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide. <laughs> because you've just told the king, news he's not going to want to hear, I want you to go hide. I'm going to hide you for a little while. He says, go to the, um, in the, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Sounds like a good life, doesn't it? I feel a little bit like I've been in the Kareth Ravine for the last six weeks. Uh, it's been great. Uh, food from heaven, and uh, or at least food that I paid for from very good people that, that cooked the food. So anyway... So he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. But some time later, the brook dried up. Remind the person next to you, the brook dried up. Why did it dry up? Because there had been no rain. Um, the brook dried up. The brook dried up. The brook God sent Elijah to. The brook that was the gift of God to Elijah. The brook that was intended to sustain Elijah it dried up. Have you ever had your brook dry up? It wasn't the thing that was his preference. It wasn't the thing that he just kind of thought it was nice to have. It was the thing Elijah needed. It was the thing that sustained him. It dried up years ago. Um, just to give you insights into pastoral ministry. In pastoral ministry... Um, things can get a little unhealthy. Sometimes you can take an unhealthy amount of ownership over pastoral ministry. It was a ministry that I was a part of that I was pretty proud of. And, and I know, if you sat down with me and talked to me, I'm smart enough to know it's God's church. It's God's. It's His church. 
But in the back of your mind, the little unhealthy part of you, you go, but it's a little bit mine. It's a little bit mine. I mean, the church had done well while I was there. And it doubled in size, and it was still growing. It looked like a fantastic future. I was taking an unhealthy amount of ownership in God's church. And I remember the day when God told me, you're taking an unhealthy amount of ownership in this church. I want you to move on. And I'm not very bright. So I had to ask God, what do you mean by that? <laughs> I had to have other people pray for me because I said, maybe I'm depressed or something like this. And I don't understand what God's trying to tell me. And I wouldn't tell other people what God was trying to tell me because I didn't want them to say what obviously God was trying to tell me. I just said, Lord, I've got to figure out what God's trying to tell me. And, and uh, God was trying to tell me, you've taken an unhealthy amount of ownership in what I'm doing. And I need you to move on for your health and for the health of this church and all of that. Don't worry. I haven't gone away and heard a word from the Lord. I'm not moving anywhere. Some of you may want that. That's all right. Yeah, keep praying. Um, but God's not listening to your prayer. I'm staying here. I'm just telling you about a time in the past. Anyway, I remember that day. It was my brook. In a lot of ways, I took my identity from that place. I had friends in that place. I was drinking Water in that place. Have you ever had your brook dry up? See, what God was telling me was that for your health, for your healing, for the healing of this church, for the growth of this church, for your continued gro growth, I need you to leave the brook. Brook dried up. God removed the brook. He changed the source. He shifted the stream. I could go on for days with the analogies about water, right? He took the thing that he led me to and took it away from me. Has God ever removed your brook? Because there are times when God has more for us, but he's got to get us out of where we are so he can get us where he needs us to be sometimes God removes something in order to teach us to rely on him because it's very easy for us to become obsessed with the way in which we encounter God instead of being obsessed with the God we encounter I believe this firmly for some of my friends that were saying we need revival because as they were talking about it, all I was hearing was, we need things to be the way they used to be. It's easy to become fixated on the things God has given us to strengthen us and to help us enjoy the life he's given us, rather than being fixated on the God who is the source of our life. When we get too attached when we get unhealthy levels of ownership over the things God has given us, there are times when God will remove what he's given us and he dries up the brook. He's trying to help us see and experience something new, new levels of growth, new levels of faithfulness, new levels uh, of, uh, of, uh, that, that help us understand the means of his provision. And he has new things for us to do that will bring him glory, but he can't do them through us if we stay at the brook. Elijah has a divine appointment with a widow in Zarephath. But he's not leaving the ravine if he's still being watered by the brook. Are you following me? Elijah has a good in the ravine. Ravens are feeding him every day from the ravine. Can you imagine, Elijah? Hey, remember that roast that you brought last week? Can we have a little bit more of that? And by the way, um, the filet was perfect. Yeah. Can you imagine that? The king and his wicked wife don't know where he is. He's safe. He's watered. He's well fed. He's rested. He's not moving from the book, brook unless God moves him. Um, where I sit over here, 
there are often children uh, over there during the announcement time, and it's fantastic because you hear all kinds of things. And every now and then, Nicole will give an announcement about something that we're doing where there's going to be food at it. And I remember one time she announced about, um, and at this event, there will be free food. And one of the kids, I believe it was one of the Wiggler kids, um, and I believe it was Lake Lakeland uh, Wiggler, um, uh, heard free food. And he goes, oh, I'm coming. <laughs> and I thought, are they making you pay for food at the Wiggler? <laughs> household and I thought Lake Lakeland you have never paid for food in your life all food to you is free food right well, Elijah was getting free food he ain't moving he can't get to what God wants to do next until he leaves the provision that God has given him until now has God ever moved your brook has he ever moved and said, we need to move habits. We need to move priorities. We need to move deeper. We need to move from being passive to being active. We need to move from being fearful to being courageous. We need to move from being passionate about all the wrong things to be passionate about God. The old brook is dried up, but there's a new provision. And Elijah needs to encounter God. And God needs Elijah to stop focusing on the brook for provision and focus on him. Um, my favorite pizza in the whole world is pizza from Pueblo, Colorado, from a place called Angie's. Angie's is a place that um, you know, just happened on. Uh, nobody told me about it or anything like that. Just saw a pizza place and thought, that's the Holy Spirit right there. Um, that's not a neon sign. That is the Holy Spirit flashing. And so... Uh, went in there, went in there with our staff uh, one day, and we went in there. They have a 42-inch pizza. Um, that's a very large pizza. You go, you go order the large, or you order the pizza you can't eat all by yourself, all right? And it, it, it's this big, and it's not just a, a gimmick. It's really good. It's the right thickness of the crust, uh, the, the right, you know, doneness of the crust. Uh, you know, not too crisp, not too doughy. Uh, it's the right amount of cheese, the right tang to the sauce. I can, I'm getting hungry talking about it. Um, you go in this place, and it was a long, narrow place. It was an old building, uh, you know, tin stamped ceiling and things like that. And um, in the back was where they cooked the pizza, and uh, you could see them cooking the pizza. So there's a guy back there throwing this, you know, 45-inch tent of pizza dough uh, around and things like that. It's a little bit crowded, a little bit too warm. Uh, a little bit too loud, but it was a fun place. And so we'd go there frequently with staff and take family there, take out of town people there. But one day, um, Angie's, um, Angelos decided they were moving, um, which was bad news to me because I, I could drive by Angelos. I frequently, frequently did. I, I, I frequently drove by there and, and, you know, the Holy Spirit always seemed to call me to Angelo's Pizza whenever I did drive there. And so I saw that they were moving, and I, I wasn't real happy about that. But we had several months' notice. And so I knew that they were moving. And then there was a day um, that they eventually moved. There was a day when, when uh, our staff needed to meet, and they all said, hey, let's go to uh, – we haven't done pizza again for a while, so let's go to pizza. And so that day was busy, long story short. As I'm driving around, I unthinkingly drove to the old location, Angelo's Pizza. And there was nobody in, parked in front of it. Parking was great that day. <laughs> How silly of, it, of me would it have been to get out of my car and go up to the window of Angelo's Pizza and press my forehead against the glass and longingly look in there and say, Angelo's Pizza is not in there anymore. That's where we used to sit. It's where I got my first pizza of that 45-inch pizza, 42-inch pizza. There were such good times, and I hate it that they moved. How silly would it have been if I, if I did that? I may have done that. I may have done that. <laughs> the new location was only like half a mile away. It was just out of the way. Half a mile out of the way. And so I drove to the new location, and the new location was great. It was a beautiful building. It was on the Riverwalk, and we sat on, a, on the porch, and 
by the river and there was a cool breeze and they brought us the 42 inch pizza and it was still really good. It was still really good. Same source, new spot, new season. See, Angelo's Pizza moved so it could expand operations to better serve its customers, to upgrade the experience. It couldn't expand operations in the old location. It had to go to the new location to do the new thing. We're not talking about pizza anymore, are we? Same source. New spot. New season. Same God. New spot, new priorities, new habits, new practices, new purposes, new season. How many of us would rather drive back to the old thing God was doing and complain that he's not doing it there anymore? Old habits, old location, they don't do it like they used to do. God's not moving anymore. I've got news for you. What makes you think God's not moving anymore? See, could it be that you're looking longingly in the window of the old thing God was doing instead of stepping boldly into the new thing that God has for us, the new way that he's moving, the new way that he's reaching? We can get lazy in the ravine. We can stay too long in the ravine. And if we stay too long in the ravine, we will dry up in the ravine because God will take the brook. Can I hear an amen? amen? The Israelites, we like old things. We're so comfortable with what we know that even if it's bad for us, we long for it. The Israelites, they're in slavery. God miraculously pulls them out of slavery. They aren't in the desert three days and the Israelites are going, you know, I wish we could go back to Egypt. Why do you want to go back to Egypt? Egypt, you were slaves. You had no agency in Egypt. You had no lives in Egypt. You couldn't make a decision for yourself in Egypt. And they said, you know, the food was really good in Egypt. What is it with our stomachs, right? The food was really good in Egypt. We can long for anything. We can sentimentalize anything. But you know what? God was moving on. One of the most powerful parts of the Exodus is towards the end um, when, uh, when the, the Ten Commandments have been given and they've been around this, this Mount Sinai for a while. And on the top of the mountain, God tells, um, tells Moses, Yahweh says to Moshe, we have stayed on this mountain long enough. Break camp in advance. Then it says that God led them through the desert with a cloud by day and a fire by night. God was leading them. As the cloud moved, they had to move. Even at the locations that seemed like nice locations, if God's cloud moved on, the people had to follow him or they were no longer with God. The brook dried up. So they... Elijah goes to Zarephath, and that story is powerful, isn't it? The story goes like this, that because of, the, because of the drought in the land, that this woman is, is running out of food. God sends Elijah to the city gate, and he sees this woman. She's picking up sticks so she can make a fire, so she can cook their last meal, and she doesn't know where the next one is. And in the, in the front of her mind, not even in the back of her mind, she is so worried. She realizes this could be the last meal I make, and then my son and I will starve, and we're, we'll die. God sends Elijah to the woman at Zarephath. And God does an, an incredible miracle there, doesn't he? God does an incredible miracle. He, he does this miracle where the jar of flour and the jar of oil never dry up. Couldn't, wouldn't that just be fantastic? I mean, let me just tell you, if God could do that to our snack cabinet, that would be just fantastic. <laughs> if, uh, you know, the, it'd probably be all the snacks I don't like. But uh, if God could do that with a snack cabinet, that would be great. But, but, but God provides miraculously. But even then, 
the story takes a turn. God says, I'm going to provide food for you this way to the woman until I provide for something else, until there is rain in the land. And then that part of the story ends this way. Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. Her response is, unex is not unexpected. She's upset. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son. That is it's a perfectly normal response, isn't it? However, in the back of our minds, is you've, you've been being fed by a miracle three meals a day. Yet, yet the anguish that she is feeling, the fear that she is feeling is incredible. I love Elijah's response. It's like he's all calm and everything. He goes, give me your son. It's like he's done this before. He's never done this before. Give me your son. He takes the son up in his, uh, from her arms, carries him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on the bed. Probably shuts the door. Probably checks down the hallway. Shuts the door. And then he falls apart. <laughs> God, what are you doing? <laughs> Here I am in this house with this woman and she's taking care of me. If she decides, if her son dies, I'm out too. And then, well, what are you doing? What is going on? The woman falls apart. The man, Elijah, the prophet, falls apart. They have been being fed with a miracle every meal, every day for quite some time. And God puts them in this situation. They're falling apart. I just want you to know it's all right to be vulnerable when God moves. It's all right to say, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know where you're going with this. I'm not sure what's happening here. Have you ever been in that situation where you just thought, God, what you doing? <laughs> to everybody else, I'm going to be calm. Give me your son. I know how to handle this. I'm going to take your son. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to shut the door and I'm going to bawl like a baby because I'm not sure what to do. Elijah, man of God. <laughs> give me your son Elijah replied he took him from her arms he carried him to the upper room where he was staying and said and laid him on the bed and then he cried out to the Lord Lord my God you have brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die then there's a then to this story then not sure what just happened oh, was, then the woman said to El then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Then the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now, now. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. A boy is resurrected. A woman is revived. And Elijah is revived. It's not individual. It's communal spreads. Next week, we'll talk about chapter 18, where Elijah goes to confront the prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Baal. And revival spreads from Elijah to all of Israel. A boy is resurrected. A woman is revived. And Elijah is revived. But you know what? I don't think Elijah has what he needs, has the faith to go confront the prophets of Baal. If he hasn't seen God raise this boy from the dead. 
And I don't think God has the faith to see this boy raised from the dead if he doesn't see God provide the food in the empty pots every day. And Elijah doesn't have the chance to see God fill the empty pots every day if he doesn't leave the Kareth Ravine. He doesn't leave the Kareth Ravine if the brook doesn't dry up. Are you feeling dry this morning? Are you wondering if God's moved your brook? Are you wondering what God is up to? Because it doesn't seem to be clear. The thing that he provided to you. The thing that he brought for you. The thing that you took so much joy in. The thing that seemed to just refresh you. Seems to be gone at this moment. Can I just say to you. That doesn't mean that God is absent. That may mean that God is saying. Move with me here. Move with me here. If you've been feeling hungry for the church to experience revival. I want you to check yourself. I want you to make sure. I want you to make sure you're not saying, hey, let's go back to the ravine because that's where God acted. That's where God was working. That's what God was doing. And you know, they don't do it like that anymore. And if we can't do it like that anymore, then God's not going to move today. I want you to know God wants to do a fresh and new thing. Do you realize this? The revival that you experienced way back then was the new thing at one time? Do you realize that? Do you realize there were folks, and you probably didn't hear them at that time, but there were folks at that time going, what is this new thing? Can't we go back to the old thing? Whatever it was before the revival, can't, we just, can't God just keep doing it this way? No, God is going to do what God is going to do because God knows there's some re resurrections that need to happen. And there are some resurrections that need to happen. And God wants to use people through whom he's doing fresh new things. And he wants to use you not only to fill up the jar, not only to confront the prophets of Baal, but to raise the boy to new life so that they know Jesus for the first time. I believe God does want to do some revival. But that doesn't mean he's going to fill the old brook again. What it means is that you and I need to be patient and ready for the new thing God wants to do through you. God's on the move. Are you coming? God's on the move. Are you moving? God's moving some priorities in here. You're going to allow him to move the priorities. God's moving some possibilities in here. You're going to let him move the possibilities. You're going to go with God. Would you stand with me? Worship team, would you come? Lord, it's all about you. It's all about what you want. We realize this, Lord. We can be set free from slavery one day and complain about it the next. It would, we are so comfortable with the way we've done things before that if you came and wrote it on the wall that this is how I want you to do it from now on, we would argue with you until we are blue in the face. But Lord, keep moving. Keep moving in our hearts. Keep calling us. If you've got to dry up a few ravines, Lord, please do it so that we know the clarity of your purpose because we understand this. There are some folks that don't know you that are far from the author of life that need to be connected with the author of life so that they can be resurrected and have new life in Christ. Lord, would you move among us today? Would your spirit be rich among us today? And would we be humble before you today? Would you move in our direction? Lord, help us release our grip on the things that we've held so tightly to, the brook that you've given us, the food that you've given us. And Lord, we've Forgive us because we've become far more impressed with your provision than we have from you. We've been far more tied to your provision than we have been tied to you. Lord, would you help move us in a new and fresh way as long as we're in the center of your spirit, Lord. We'll go wherever you call us to go.
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're coming next week, I want you to buckle up. I want you to wear your crash helmet because I think God's got some good things for us. All right. We're going to be excited. Would you sing with your whole heart today? Because I think God uses people who, who use their passion for him this morning. Let's praise our Lord.